All right, so um, welcome. This is the review for uh, the exam we're going to have this week. Um, this is Earth and Space Science 102, and this is the end of our entire um, section on meteorology. So really good news is if you've really hated this unit, we're moving on to a completely different subject starting right after Mardi Gras you know, or before Mardi Gras, whenever you start, want to start getting into the, the videos for unit two. After this, we'll start um, covering the solar system. We'll, we'll start the astronomy section of, um, of this class, and we'll be doing astronomy for the rest of the semester. So um, first I wanted to kind of just Oh, let's see, get out of this briefly, go back to this. Um, and I'm going to do a share screen thing so I can take you guys through Moodle again. And I can um, kind of be working on these review questions with you guys. Hmm. Wait. That's not, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Okay. So I'm doing a whole share screen thing. I'm going to get a bunch of annoying messages saying, Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Um, and first, I wanted to show you guys, of course, where this is going to take place in Moodle and just go over the basics. Um, yes, I know I'm sharing my screen. Um, you guys already did the Unit 1 mini test. That was just on the first five lectures of Unit 1. Um, the Unit uh, 1 overall exam will be all of the material from the mini test. So it's the first five lectures again, which is why I feel like I can replace your grade if you do better on this unit exam than you did on the mini test because it's still sort of evaluating your understanding of the same thing, just giving you another chance at it. Um, so it's all of the first five lectures. That's air pressure, circulation of the atmosphere, fronts, thunderstorms and tornadoes, hurricanes. And if you're looking for more of an outline um, or like a study guide for the exams, then that's where the lecture outlines come in because it's more of a comprehensive. Here's every single thing that we went over in all of the lectures. And then we're adding six, seven and eight. So six, seven, and eights were a transition from talking really sort of about the, the weather part of meteorology to the climate part of meteorology. So I switched from talking short term to long term. Six is almost kind of segueing us into astronomy a little bit. It's about general earth motions and how they affect seasons. And then later on, we'll see how all of that then affects climate change. And then the last two lectures are on climate change. And I mentioned this in the lectures themselves, but the reason I split this into two lectures is one, it's too much information for one lecture. Um, two, it's um, really important to not really muddle the message of man-made climate change by introducing a lot of confusion between the natural mechanisms of climate change and man-made climate change. Most of all, that um, man-made or anthropogenic climate change is something that's taking place really, really quickly. And the mechanisms that cause that climate change act really fast, as opposed to most of the mechanisms of natural climate change taking a really, really long time. So, um, you know, I, I try to spell that out as much as possible. And part of why I do this is to further differentiate the two, natural versus man-made climate change. So there's two different lectures there. The actual test that starts, um, it'll open tomorrow night. So that's Monday, February 21st at 6 p.m. Um, we'll uh, be open for 24 hours. It will only take uh, half an hour to take. Um, you have a total of 30 minutes unless you have some sort of accommodation that gives you more time um, to take the test. And it's only 25 questions. So it's a few more than the mini test where you only have 15 questions, but these will all be multiple choice. I find, you know, I like to do a few true false questions on the mini tests, but they, they do tend to drive everybody crazy too a little bit. You know, I think um, there's a little bit more anxiety that goes into the true false question. So I try to um, limit those or erase them entirely on the unit exams. So 25 multiple choice questions and you have a half an hour to do it. Um, in addition to the exam closing Tuesday, uh, February 22nd at 6 p.m., this assignment will also close then too. This is the unit one extra credit assignment. So for each unit, you can answer uh, one 
of the review questions that I go over chosen by me. Um, and as long as you follow the instructions, you answer it entirely and your answer is correct, you're going to get the points for it. And it's an all or nothing thing. So it's either eight points or you didn't follow the instructions and it's nothing. So definitely take the time to do it right. Um, so the extra credit assignment closes with the exam, except it's not, it doesn't open with the exam. It's open now. You can do it whenever you want. Um, so um, this is, you know, from a while back. That's why it's not open to you guys. I'll replace this with the video that we're doing right now. Um, and then these review questions I've already pulled up down here. So I'll open up the Word document for it, zoom in on it a little bit. So you guys will hopefully be able to see this a little bit better. Mm. And um, <clears throat> And um, we're going to go through mainly just the last three questions off of here. So if you go back and you look at the somewhat lengthy review I did for the mini test, I kind of got away from myself a little bit. We went over an hour just by a little bit. Um, but uh, in the context of that, I went over the first six of these questions and I went into a, sort of a sub question off of question three right here. So the extra credit assignment is actually question three off of this document. It's the same question and I answer it in the other review session. So if you're not completely um, uh, confident of your answer, you want to double check it, not only can you get the answer out of the lecture video, but you can also get the answer to this question with exactly the same wording and everything uh, from my review. Just make sure that when you submit it, it's all in your own words to the furthest extent possible and that you've covered all your bases, answered the whole questions, question, and it makes sure that it's at least 100 words. Um, so effectively, this, if you didn't go back and do the um, the review for the first mini test, it's definitely worth it to go back because I answered these six questions. I'm mainly going to concentrate on seven, eight, and nine today. And then I'll take, you know, any questions from any part of unit one after uh, we go through these. So just to make sure, let me go back real quick. I usually get kind of a message when somebody posts a question, but let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Okay. So um, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to throw them at me. Um, you can take yourself off mute, shout them out to me, or you can type them in over here. I'll just start going through the review questions for now though, starting with seven. So um, question seven is from lecture six. And lecture six is where I start talking about um, seasons, basic earth motions, the earth spins and that's a day, the earth orbits around the sun, that's a year and so on. So question seven is talking about seasons. Explain what happens to the sun's position in the sky from our point of view at 30 degrees north. So that's our latitude. Um, as we orbit the sun. Hint, describe the change in the sun's angle with the ground surface. Does it ever reach directly overhead, et cetera? And this is from, again, our perspective at 30 degrees. Seasons on Earth are entirely dependent on your latitude, your um, distance away from the equator. Um, the seasons of the polar regions get really, really weird. You get six months of daylight, six months of darkness. It's a very weird place to be. Seasons at the equator end up a little bit more like, um, you know, almost the equivalent of, of like um, uh, two summers with something like a fall in between. So it's only when you get um, in somewhat of the middle latitudes, um, north and south of the equator, that you get what we sort of more classically think of as, as four seasons. And you could even make the argument that in Louisiana, we don't even have a proper fourth season, although it's been pretty cold this winter. So the way I like to go through answering this question is to think about the first day of each season, um, the solstices and the equinoxes, and get sort of a general sense of where the sun's angle is and then how that's going to affect seasons. So I'll start with um, our upcoming uh, beginning of a new season, and that is the first day of spring. Um, so that's called the vernal or spring equinox happens either March 21st, March 22nd every year. 
And at that point every year, our solar angle, which is going to be the main thing that's going to control temperature and therefore going to control what we classically think of as seasons, is going to be somewhat in the middle. So um, one thing I wanted to go back to is in this class, with very, very few exceptions, you never really want to memorize numbers. You know, so I had some very specific numbers that I threw in for our general solar angle at this the spring equinox and the summer solstice and so on. You don't need to memorize those. Um, so at the spring equinox, it's going to be in the sort of low 60s. It's going to be our solar angle. Um, so we're just going to say sort of a middle solar angle. And I'll put the number in here. I'm just trying to emphasize that you don't need to memorize this number. So something like maybe 60 degrees. And so that sort of moderate middle solar angle means that the sun's not really high up in the sky, causing a lot of heat over a smaller period, a smaller area on the Earth's surface. And that means higher temperatures. Um, it means it's going to be a little bit lower than that. And that means that that same total amount of heat, total amount of energy is spread across a wider area meaning cooler overall temperatures than you would get during the summer when you have higher solar angle. But that also means that you're going to have somewhat shorter days than you get um, during what we think of as, as the summer, the uh, you know June, July, August months. Um, so that's basically what this means though. Um, also going back to an equinox, this point, this day every year, and it changes a little bit from each day to the, each year to the next, it's gonna be maybe the 21st one year, the 22nd the next year. Um, is essentially the time the sun passes directly over the equator. And this means that anywhere on earth, you have equal days and nights, 12 hour days, 12 hour nights. So a middle solar angle means sort of moderate, temperatures and not the longest day, not the shortest day, somewhat average sort of day length. The next one that's going to come after this is the summer solstice. And unlike the equinoxes, this always happens the same day every year, June 21st. Um, so this is where you're going to get the highest solar angle, but not 90 degrees. We would only get the sun being directly overhead on the summer solstice if we were at a very particular um, uh, latitude on Earth. Because the Earth's tilt is 23 and a half degrees, the latitude of 23 and a half degrees is where you have to be to have the sun be directly overhead on the summer solstice. And that line, that latitude is called the Tropic of Cancer. So the highest solar angle, but not 90 degrees, closer to low 80s, means highest temperatures and longest days. And then after this, you have the first day of fall, right? The autumnal or fall equinox which is going to be a lot like the spring equinox, except instead of trying to warm up the oceans, you're cooling them back down. So you have warmer temperatures around the fall equinox than you do at the beginning of spring um, at the end of March. Uh, and it's mainly because of water temperatures. It takes a long time to heat up and cool down the oceans on Earth. So again, you have sort of middle solar angles around 60 degrees again and moderate temps. And then finally, we have another solstice, the winter solstice, where you're going to have the lowest solar angles, low 40 degree solar angles, and lowest temperatures, and uh, shortest days. All right, 
So um, the last thing I want to kind of emphasize here, I'll just make a new line for this, is that these days mark the beginning of each season. And not the middle, mainly because of the time it takes to heat up and cool down the oceans on Earth. It's a whole lot easier to heat up and cool down the actual ground surface on Earth. That happens a lot more rapidly. So effectively, if there were no oceans on Earth to heat up and cool back down, then you would almost have this case where um, the, the solstices and equinoxes marked the middle of each season, the peak of each season, as opposed to the beginning of each season. But you can kind of think of the summer solstice, which really sort of almost should be the hottest day um, as the beginning of summer instead, because of this delay, because of this time and energy that it takes to actually warm up the oceans. And once you've warmed them up, then you have your highest overall temperatures, you know, closer to you know, either the middle or almost the end of summer, you know, in like August. So keep that in mind. It's mainly due to the oceans. And then this is going to relate back to um, hurricane season. Uh, one of the questions on the last exam was about like a true false question about when we have the, um, the peak of hurricane season, the most intense hurricanes. And I think it was a true false question. It said something like um, the largest number of storms form at the beginning of the hurricane season in June. And that was false. That is where when hurricane season begins, but it's not the peak hurricane season. Peak hurricane season is like August, September. And again, it's because of the time and energy it takes to warm up the oceans. So keep that in mind. The last two questions deal with climate change, but I was going to give you guys just a minute if you had any questions, any follow up from seven or really anything from that lecture on the seasons. Okay, check back over here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Cool. All right. So, next question. What are the natural mechanisms for climate change? I'm actually going to push this down to the next page so I don't feel like I'm under pressure running out of room in Microsoft Word. What are the natural mechanisms for climate change and how long approximately do they take to dramatically change global temperatures? Remember, when I'm dealing with even a review question, I'm always talking in general terms, always talking about, you know, like approximate time that something takes. So for the purposes of something like an exam, it's definitely super inefficient to memorize a bunch of numbers when you can always think about these things in more general terms. Like instead of knowing that 80% of the atmosphere is composed of, of nitrogen, know that nitrogen is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere. Effectively, it's the same thing, but you're not wasting brain space trying to memorize a number that's not really useful to your everyday life. So, Question eight, what are the natural mechanisms for climate change? How long approximately do they take? And approximately being hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, hundreds of years, you know, those are very different things to dramatically change global temperatures. So in the context of lecture seven, which is where I talk about natural climate change, um, I have this big sort of sum up sentence. It's probably like really text heavy to try to like type down in the middle of the lecture, but it's essentially the only things that can and do naturally change climate. So to say nothing about man-made climate, just natural mechanisms for climate change. And it's effectively anything that changes um, the positions of uh, continents versus oceans on Earth, the distribution of continents on Earth, and that's plate tectonics. Anything that changes um, the amount of heat we get from the sun. And so that's any changes in Earth's position in space, changing the amount of heat we're getting from the sun. That's Milankovitch cycles. 
And then finally, anything that changes the composition of the atmosphere, which would sort of be where anthropogenic climate change would factor in if we were counting that, but we're only talking about natural climate change. And so this in natural terms is going to relate back to volcanic activity or um, impacts. So the three things that naturally change the climate, the plate tectonic cycle, Milankovitch cycles, and volcanic activity and potentially impacts. So plate tectonics changes climate by changing the positions of continents and oceans on Earth over not even just millions of years, we're going to say hundreds of millions of years. So you can think about this change as either being in a local sense, you know, if you're talking about the changes that our area like southern Louisiana has gone through, you know, at some point in the, the distant enough past, you know, this land wasn't even here, it was ocean. Um, prior to that, parts of what is now Louisiana was part of the Yucatan. It was even more tropical than it was today. Um, if you go back far enough, then what we think of as our location today was the desert, was the bottom of the ocean. So change happens uh, locally. Change also happens on a global scale because of plate tectonics, because of how the plate tectonic cycles affect um, oceanic circulation. And I mentioned in the course of the lecture about how there, you know, um, have been um, ocean stratification events that have related back to supercontinents, how um, the supercontinent Rodinia caused a global glaciation, essentially like snowball earth where ice covered the entire earth. And so these are all just examples. The examples themselves aren't really that important. It's the overall concept that where the continents are and where the oceans are has a huge effect on um, local and global climate on Earth. So the big takeaway here is over hundreds of millions of years. This doesn't happen rapidly. This is very hard to confuse with man-made climate change. The second one of these, the Milankovitch cycles, is effectively anything that's changing the amount of heat we're getting from the sun. The Milankovitch cycles are changes in the um, shape of the Earth's orbit. That's known as eccentricity, comma, changes in the Earth's axial tilt. That's called obliquity. And changes in the orientation of Earth's axial tilt or the wobble, if you prefer to think about it that way. That's called the precession. So these three things, eccentricity, obliquity, and precession, are three natural Earth motions, just as natural as the Earth going around the sun and the Earth spinning to create our days. Um, and these three um, uh, uh, changes occur really slowly over time. They're cyclic, just like the Earth orbiting the sun, and they do affect our climate, again, both sort of regionally and globally. But these take a really, really long time too. Maybe not hundreds of millions of years, but these changes occur over tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. <laughs> Sorry, I just decided I was going to scratch that and actually write it out this way. So 
the important thing again to take away here is that this is a long term mechanism for climate change and in that same way very difficult to mix up with anthropogenic man made climate change happening over the last couple of decades as opposed to happening over time scans time spans before human civilizations now, Milankovitch cycles do relate to one form of climate change that we know a lot about that's happened in the recent geologic record to a really high degree, and that's getting in and out of ice ages that we think are almost entirely the result of these Milankovitch cycles. Now, the only one that's actually you know, possible to mix up with man-made climate change is the me mechanism of natural climate change that happens over the most um, rapid time scales. So it's almost instantaneous time scales. And that's the uh, effect that really substantive volcanic activity has. So changes in the concentration of greenhouse gases released from volcanic activity and dust debris in the atmosphere from volcanic activity and meteorite impacts changes climate very rapidly, effectively, instantaneously. So um, this is really the only one that's comparable to man-made climate change because it's effectively doing the same thing that our contribution to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuel do. Effectively, when you have substantive enough volcanic activity, it releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, warming the climate. It can create this trigger effect with methane hydrates, which then further warms the climate. And that's in the past when, when we've had the worst uh, mass extinctions have been sort of a runaway greenhouse effect without um, having any sort of natural mechanism to to stop that process. And then you end up with lots and lots of species dying off. So we haven't had volcanic activity that has had the kind of contribution to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the last, um, you know, in, in the last, you know, five million years or so um, that really compares it all to our contribution to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But, you know, it's pretty important to note that effectively, if you were going to place man-made climate change into any of these three um, sort of uh, um, time scale factors of natural mechanisms for climate change, it would definitely have to be in this last one. So, um, that's definitely the most difficult of the review questions that we need to go over. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about that one, um, you know, or, or really anything from that lecture um, seven on natural mechani mechanisms for climate change. Come over here and check. Everything looks pretty good over here. Okay. So um, moving on to the last question, which isn't describe anthropogenic climate change, it's the next step. So I think this is really, really heavily missed in discussions on um, anthropogenic man-made climate change, that it's really not so much about the climate change itself, especially from our perspective, because we get, tend to get really selfish about the conversation, you know, and we go, okay, well, you know, so let's say it's two degrees warmer. Like, does that really hurt me? You know, what does that do? It's not necessarily all about the most obvious effect. It's about the secondary effects. And so that's what I wanted to kind of call to attention in the context of this question. Describe the effect that anthropogenic, which means man-made, climate change will have on sea level, cyclonic storms, wildfires, et cetera. 
So I'll put this into a couple of categories and we'll then look at the result of all of um, the result on all of these things by climate change. So the result of climate change on sea level, the result on cyclonic storms, and then the result on wildfires. And then in the same category, we'll put droughts, floods, etc. Okay, now the first really obvious effect of anthropogenic climate change is change in sea level. Sea level rises in a warmer world. Now, the reason sea level rises in a warming world is because twofold, you melt ice and you melt specifically continental ice in the polar regions. And where does that go? It goes into the oceans. There's more water in the oceans. That means higher sea level. Sorry, I got kind of grammar failure over here. So the, the result of warming temperatures um, because of melting continental ice in the polar regions and water expanding due to increase in temperature. So the actual volume of water changes dependent upon its temperature and the amount of increase in volume of water is directly related to the temperature. So that means that if the temperature increases, so does the amount of space that water takes up. And if water's taking up more space, then that has to relate to a rise in sea level. Now, I do, <coughs> I do a lot of graphics in this lecture and a whole lot on the effect to South Louisiana specifically. You know, the big takeaway messages there aren't necessarily where is the highest place to be, where is the place you want to be with a 200 foot rise in sea level. It's what's going to happen in the range of our lifetime to really, really vulnerable areas like New Orleans. How much of a rise in sea level do you have to have before New Orleans is just sort of a, a even more so than it is now, a walled off levee? island almost with periodic flooding even after all of the efforts from the army corps of engineers you know and i have a test question um that i think is on sort of a longer version of the test that i give when i give it in person but it's you know um uh, true or false new orleans would be inundated by a five foot rise in sea level um, and that would be true, you know, without uh, engineering to match the um, demands of a warmer world and rise in sea level, then that's absolutely what's going to happen. So sea level, particularly for us in South Louisiana, is at least one of the two, if not the most important effect of climate change and one that we should all be paying attention to and we should all be worried about. Um, the second one, which we should all definitely still be worried about, is cyclonic storms, because these include not only mid-latitude cyclones, but anything tropical as well, especially anything tropical, um, including hurricanes. So cyclonic storms are essentially centers of low pressure that are entirely dependent on warmth and moisture to drop the pressure and to get worse. So in a warmer, wetter world, which is the result of climate change, obviously cyclonic storms increase in frequency and they increase in severity. So it's, let me fix my spelling here on frequency. I still didn't fix my spelling. How do you spell frequency? Why it doesn't look like me? You know what? That's how we're going to spell frequency. That's fine. So um, with 
cyclonic storms, it's really easy to, you know, pull the trigger of saying this particular storm wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the climate change that had already happened. It's really easy to point the finger at one particular thing, but we, we don't really know that for sure. We don't know that um, if it weren't for the climate change that's happened over the last 10, 20 years, that Ida wouldn't, would have taken place last fall. Um, you know, and, and we just, we don't know that for sure. But what we do know is that the frequency of storms that we get, the number of hurricanes, the number of tropical storms is worse than it was 10 years ago, which is definitely already worse than it was 10 years before that and so on and so forth. So increase in frequency, also increase in severity. The peak hurricane season that we get is, um, is far stronger. We have more um, major hurricanes than we would have had 20, 30 years ago. You know, so that's just a, a real thing going forward. I've kind of tried to frame this from the perspective of hurricanes, because of course that's our worry down here, but winter storms are also the result of heat and warmth. I know it doesn't really seem that way, you know, but any kind of cyclonic storm feeds off of the warm sector. So all of those really tragic winter storms that cover, you know, areas like Ohio and tons and tons of ice and blizzards, they get worse every year, just like hurricanes get worse every year. And even though they're dumping a bunch of ice and snow, they are actually the result of a warmer world. Finally, down here, the last major effect of anthropogenic climate change is that um, dry areas are getting drier. Wet areas are getting wetter. So effectively in a warmer world, you have more evaporation, you have more precipitation, but it gets more heavily concentrated on areas that are already flood prone and already have plenty of precipitation. You know, so we have, um, you know, more of the effects that we don't already need and, um, uh, you know, coming out of, of this. We have more floods that aren't even necessarily related to things like named storms. It can be unnamed tropical storms. They might not even be tropical storms. And we have greater flooding in South Louisiana. Places like Southern California and Colorado, um, they have more droughts and droughts lead to wildfires, all as a result of a warmer, a warmer world. So the sort of um, the issues that they face, that you face wherever you are in the world climatically, um, all really get a lot worse in a warmer world. And you have to kind of consider that when you're approaching the whole climate change problem. So, okay, I'll jump off my soapbox for a second here, format that a little bit. And um, just kind of, again, emphasize that these are the last three questions um, of a total of nine. And these first six we covered in um, the, the, the first of these um, two review sessions. We covered this when we reviewed for the mini test. So I wanted to point out again to you, if you go into Moodle, and this is independent of which section you're in, if you go up to all of the stuff for the mini test, you can check your browser again, get it ready for the test, and you can go back in and do this review video again, or just kind of scan around, just make sure you get the information that you need. And I cover question three on um, uh, things that create and deflect winds as part of this video too. So um, before I end the recording, um, New Orleans Atlantis edition, I'm sorry, I missed that earlier. That's scary and funny. And um, uh, New Orleans looks really good above water. I don't want to see it underwater. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I'm not going to go there. I'm going, it would be very muddy. Yeah. It wouldn't be like pretty Atlantis. It would be covered in mud from Mississippi Atlantis. Um, so before I end the recording, do you guys have any further comments? Anything else?
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.